Welcome to Your Fantastic Mind. I'm Jay Watson. This is a show where we explore the mysteries and the science of the amazing human brain. Close to three and a half million people in the U.S. have epilepsy. Epilepsy actually means seizure disorder. It's the fourth most common neurological disorder and it affects people of all ages. Medications can control it, but not always. People lose their jobs, the ability to drive, to be safe from injury in their own homes. This is the story of a young mother named Jalisa Thomas. She decided to get epilepsy surgery. We chronicled her year-long journey to try to return to a seizure-free life. Well, getting ready for the big day. It's obviously a lot for patients to take on. Um, they're very courageous uh, to do it. This is seizure one. Our goal was no seizures, no side effects. God of creation, God of human. It's gonna be all right. Okay. It can give me a chance to get my life on track. Just put it on the counter. A crowded kitchen filled with three generations of a family, including an overly helpful six-year-old, paints an idyllic picture. The reality is that Alvin and Marcy Thomas had to move in with their 30-year-old daughter, Jalisa, and granddaughter, Veda, because neither of them were safe anymore. It was something out of the blue, unexpected, horrifying, because it took her so long to breathe. The seizures began when Jalisa was pregnant with Veda. Going to the market, and they were sitting at the light, and she began to have a seizure. And she basically floated out in the middle of an intersection on her red light. Before a seizure comes on now, sometimes a warning will come, starting from my head, through my body. It's like a rushing feeling, and it, I will either just lose consciousness and I will, it's like missing moments of my life. I started not being able to go anywhere on my own. Over the course of six years, Jalisa would try different medications, but the seizures continued. She had to quit her job as a preschool teacher. She gave up driving and still she and her daughter weren't safe. She had a seizure cooking dinner one night and fell onto the stove. My shirt burned through to my bra and I was slumped over on the stove. My dad told me that he had to pull me off of the stove. Get my keys back, They've tried to keep life normal for Veda. Two, three, four, five. Uh oh. <laughs> But when it comes to her mother's struggles, she is surprisingly sober-minded for a kindergartner. It really feels like I want to protect her so much from any harm against her. She has seen a lot at six years old. I had to call the ambulance, but I didn't know the number of the ambulance. The darkest point arrived on what began as a regular morning, Jalisa getting Veda ready for school and walking her out to the bus. The last thing I remember was going out of the door. In the fog of a seizure that hit at the end of her driveway, Jalisa wandered in the rain a mile from her house down a busy road used by tractor trailers. I noticed that she hadn't come back in the house. With me coming to all I remember is reaching into my pocket and looking at my phone and seeing my mom's missed call. And I was all the way down the road at the church. That, that's a mile down the road. I called my mom and she asked me was I in the house and I'm like, no, I don't know where I am. And she said, look around you, what do you see? And I you know, said the name of the church. And she's like, what are you doing down there? I said, I do not know. Her family came to get her, but Jalisa was distraught and couldn't remember if she put Veda on the bus. She called the school. Veda was there. I had to talk to her teacher and ask, could I please talk to her just to make sure that she was safe? 
I did not remember putting her on the bus. She, she talked to me and she said, Mommy, you, you put me on the bus, you know. I, and I, asked, I said, what did I say to you? She, she said, you said, have a nice day. I, I don't remember any of that. Yes, sir, I help you. Easy. All right. <laughs> well, getting ready for the big day. What Jalisa is about to do feels daunting, but it is her best hope at regaining control of her life. She has already spent two weeks at Emory University Hospital having her seizures recorded. Emory neurosurgeon Dr. Robert Gross. You came in for long-term video monitoring. Uh, we captured three seizures uh, several months ago. Uh, and um, what we learned from that is that, the, uh, that there were some abnormalities in the electrical signals in the right side of the brain, okay, so, so on the, in the right hemisphere. Um, they tended to be uh, in the uh, settle into the temporal area. Tomorrow will be the first step in a lengthy process that will hopefully stop Jaleesa's seizures. My family and I are strong, we are strong believers of faith, so I, be, I believe in trying things out. You know? Epilepsy is recurrent seizures. A seizure is a an abnormal um, occurrence of electrical activity that's hypersynchronous or very, very synchronized uh, that leads to a behavioral manifestation. Um, and people can have a single isolated seizure. If I go out and drink too much and fall and hit my head on the ground, I might have a seizure or two. Um, and, uh, but that does not constitute epilepsy. Epilepsy is recurrent seizures. It's been less than 10 years that doctors have been doing precision surgery to treat drug-resistant epilepsy, what Jalisa has. Her seizures are cryptogenic, meaning doctors don't know why she has them. Our goal, as with all physicians in this area, is no seizures, no side effects. So, Jalisa Thomas. A team of neurosurgeons, epileptologists, and researchers discussed Jalisa's case the night before surgery. So that's diagnostic of side of onset or yeah, site? Yeah, it strongly supports lateralization. This is seizure this is one. one. The data gathered from Jalisa's seizures in her first day in the hospital helped to identify targets for 15 electrodes that will be implanted in her brain tomorrow. Right side, temporal, Orbital frontal, yeah. insular, yeah. posterior cingulate. We have to go very anterior to get that, that mucosal area. Behind it. Yeah. If we sort of, you know, do this 3D grid, if you will, in that spot. All right, we've got a plan. Yeah, things sounds good. All right, so you're going to get this set up, and I will see you at 7 in the morning, mm -hmm. and we'll go over the plan. Morning. Morning. How are you doing? Good, good. It's about uh, 15 minutes. We'll bring you back. Okay. Put you to sleep. Okay. I'll stay awake. Yeah. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> and uh, uh, it'll be about about five or six hours, and you'll be all done. Big breath. God of healing. We give it all to you, dear Lord. So we, right now we give you all the power, we all, all the glory over everything that's going to occur today, God. We ask you to be with the surgeons, be with the nurses, be with everyone.
the procedure she's having we call stereo EEG, which means 3D EEG. Stereo is like your stereo sound system. It gives you a 3D depiction of the sound. This will give us a three-dimensional depiction of where her seizures are actually coming from. And of course, the brain is a three-dimensional structure, so it gives us a much more accurate picture of exactly where the seizures are coming from. A robotic assistant called Rosa will be used to help the team implant the electrodes in Jalisa's brain. Once we attach her head to the robotic assistant, we'll prep and drape it in the usual fashion, and then we will activate a foot switch, and that will drive the, assi the assistant to the exact spot for each one of these electrodes. We'll then drill a small hole, size of a regular drill bit, um, put in a small bolt through the skin into the skull, and then pass the electrode through that bolt into the spot. So in the OR, we are communicating with the neurosurgery team, making sure we understand exactly where every depth of electrode has been placed. We then look at the recordings from it. We verify the integrity. Do the recordings look good? Or do they need to go and make sure the connections are tight? We will wait to, as we say, capture her seizures. So she will have continuous video and EEG monitoring through these electrodes. feeling? All over the place. That? It's been a week. Like With the enough. electrodes doing their job and cameras rolling around the clock, Jalisa has had a few seizures. Not enough to go home yet. We need to get some more seizures and find out what's going on. Right. Okay. And uh, taking you off your medicine and you know, it's only been a week so you getting a little frustrated yet or are you still okay? Yeah, just a little. A little I'm just I'm not used to being so uncomfortable for right. so long. There is a way to break the monotony of being in a bed awaiting the next seizure. Hey, Miss Thomas. Oh, hello. Doing okay? Doing all right. All right, you up for, up for doing some research today? Within a few minutes, Jalisa is playing a video game. Press the button when you get to the bench. Or what looks like a video game. You got 40 points there. Looked like you had some neurons firing, so you definitely uh, were working. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. We'll have to analyze the data now and then see um, see what was firing and, and how it all worked, OK? OK. Jalisa agreed to participate in research during her time in the hospital. Every day, they visit her. This is a rare window into the human brain. Jalisa presents an incredible opportunity to see the electrical activity in the human brain in real time. Neurosurgeon Dr. John Willey, cognitive neuroscientist Dr. Corey Inman, and Dr. Gross are collaborating with researchers at Columbia University to try to understand how memory works. A lot of epilepsy occurs in networks that are related to memory, so this gives us an opportunity to study these networks by asking the patients to remember things, to take part in particular tasks um, that are very specific, very well controlled, so we can understand and, and be able to dissect how memory systems work. Even more than understanding memory, Willie and Inman and Gross are part of a team proving you can actually improve it. This is where we're actually stimulating to enhance right. memory. The brain is an electrical organ communicating with electrical activity, delivering small bursts of electrical stimulation to parts of the brain that help you remember important events of your life can boost memory. The amygdala is kind of like the brain save button. In Jalisa's case, she might be shown images or pictures while electrical stimulation is delivered via one of the electrodes in her brain, in her amygdala. Research shows it could boost her memory of that image by 15%. We're actually showing that we can enhance memory the next day, um, which has not ever been shown in any other type of study that has looked at uh, memory enhancement to specific events um, over time. This discovery has dramatic implications for a variety of issues, everything from traumatic brain injuries to epilepsy to the six million Americans living with Alzheimer's disease. The dream is potentially a device or a process. Maybe it's invasive, maybe it's not invasive. But by understanding the rules, ultimately, we give him back the life that he had, where he doesn't have to think about, he doesn't have to expend all that energy on just the basics of, oh, now I need to, now I need to go make lunch. 
It means being able to remember what matters to us, like this. I love you too. It's gonna be all right. It's okay. I'm a big girl. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I love mean, you, Mom. I love you too. See you tomorrow. <clears throat> Two weeks in a day. After two weeks and 10 seizures, Dr. Gross and his team are ready. This is the front, this is the back. Sort of a crude diagram, but this is that frontal area. And then they spread to this hippocampus over here. This is the hippocampus and there were, there were um, three electrodes, one in the amygdala, two in the hippocampus that, uh, that all of the seizures, except for one, involved. So we can do 22, 5, 6, 7 to 7, 8, 9, and then we have 1 through 4 left. Right, right, right. And then do you want to do bipolar, 1, 2 to 3, 4, or do you want to do those monopolar? This one. We've spent a lot of time figuring out exactly where her seizures are coming from, and um, we've identified um, basically five different electrodes, different leads going in the brain that, uh, that are the source of the seizures. Um, those areas need to be removed or ablated, which is another word for destruction. Um, since we have the electrodes already in place, what we can do is connect up this, what we call lesion generator, up to the electrodes. And this will cause the, the tips, those contacts at the end, to heat up and destroy, burn out those, uh, those spots where the seizures were coming from. Called a radio frequency lesion generator, it passes an electrical current through the electrodes in her brain. This passes electrical uh, impulses into the brain, but it does so at so-called radio frequencies, which are a very high frequency. And as it's doing that, it's alternating current. So at first it's positive, then it's negative, then it's positive, and then it's negative. And the ions in the brain, all those water molecules basically, uh, are polarized. So they will align with the electrical field when it's one way, and then when it switches around, they have to flip around and go the other direction. So it creates movement in the molecules very, very fast. And when they move, just like when your car moves, it generates heat, it generates heat from those molecules. So it can heat the brain up um, as we're doing that. The heat okay. will ablate or destroy that area of brain where the seizures are coming from. What Jalisa is going to experience, as we discussed yesterday, is a popping sound. So uh, as this happens, it generates some gas from hydrolysis, um, and she will, ex she will hear those bubbles as they come off the end of that, those electrical contacts that are in her brain. You heard that. <laughs> you heard that? The brain has no pain receptors, so Jalisa can only hear the ablation. All right, next pair. Not feel it. It might be enough. In a number of cases, this has been sufficient to stop the seizures. If not, we'll come back, as we talked about yesterday, and go in with that laser, which can do a bigger, bigger area. She had six seizures over the next 10 hours. Jalisa's six seizures in 10 hours after the in-room ablation tells the team they irritated the area generating seizures but couldn't get all of it. The laser can destroy two to three times the area. The laser ablation uses very high intensity laser light that's passed in through a fiber optic into the same region. In this case, we need to exchange the electrode for the fiber optic. Um, but it can cause a, and it directly heats the tissue with those photons from the laser light. We can monitor that using the MRI scan because the MRI acts as a thermometer. Uh, so I can actually monitor the temperature to which I heat the tissue and give a much more controlled lesion, and I can visualize it when it's happening. Dr. Gross explains how it is that one can safely destroy areas in the brain. There's this, this uh, uh, concept in the lay population promoted by us doctors a lot that there's large regions of the brain that are doing nothing. 
it's not so much that there are large regions of the brain that are doing nothing, so much as when we take them out, we don't necessarily see the effects of removing those areas on someone's function, either because um, it's below the level of detection, mm -hmm. it's doing something but we, we can't really detect it, or we, we really can't, te we don't have the right tests, uh, or there is redundancy. Um, so in certain areas there's, there's ways in which we can fill in. We have a rule in epilepsy surgery that unless you can take out the entire seizure onset zone, your chances of being successful are 20 percent versus 80 percent if we can take out the entire seizure onset zone. I would measure the electrode when it comes out. They finalize their plan once again to destroy the remaining areas. This is a 3D depiction of whichever electrodes uh, or trajectories that I have activated. Each electrode tract is near each other, um, but there could be areas in between that, that I couldn't get with a radio frequency ablation. How are you now? I'm driving on my own. I'm working overjoyed. That's the word that I can think of right now. I'm overjoyed. It has been eight months since her laser surgery, long enough to build a whole new life. Now 31, Jaleesa's parents will soon move out. She is working, even driving, to her own follow-up appointment with Dr. Gross. So I hear you're doing really well, so yes. no seizures? None. So none at all? None, no migraines. No migraines. I haven't really had any headaches at all. Don't That's really fantastic. Know. People always want to know how long do I have, have to go before I know this problem is licked. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the answer is we don't always know. Um, we have predictors. The fact Jaleesa made it beyond the six-month mark, seizure-free, is big. When we get to six months, that's kind, that's kind of a break. Um, and at, at six months, um, most people that are seizure-free at six months remain seizure-free for a year and two years and beyond that. For almost seven years, the electrical storms in Jaleesa's brain wreaked havoc on her life. Modern medicine, powered by relentless research, has ended those storms, delivering calm. The hair is all grown in on the side again. Like, <laughs> I mean, I was trying to cover it up. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, your hair is. You know what? <laughs> I'm still waiting for my hair to grow back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good six months. Let me know if there's any problems you run into, okay? Thank you. Um, any Lesson. problems you have, you. Um, just give us a call. Aside okay. from that, I'll see you in six months. I love these kind of flowers. It's a lot of them growing because the sun is coming up. Veda scours the grass for four-leaf clovers. In a seven-year-old world of magic and luck, her wish has already come true. Honeysuckles grow back in the woods. And in the creek. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> yeah, I Jaleesa's story speaks to the power of research and science. It also speaks to the determination of a devoted mother willing to fight to get her life back. That's going to do it for us this week. We'll see you next time on Your Fantastic Mind.